together.
just thank you, God, because of you, we are alive. It's only through your death and resurrection, God, that we find ourselves saved by your power alone, Lord. Not by works that any man should boast, God, because I have nothing to offer you, Lord. And yet you have desired us, Lord, to be your portion. God, we thank you. We are so grateful, Lord, that you die for us and offer us freely salvation, God. We just need to receive it. So with humble hearts, Lord, we come before you this morning and we say thank you. We say thank you because we are so grateful, Lord, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. Lord, we thank you that your resurrection from the grave, Lord, is, the, is what gives us hope of future resurrection for us. Lord, may all the glory and the power and the honor be yours forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I know, it's finally Easter. So, oh, so we have, um, I want you to know if it's your first time with us, we are so glad that you're here today. We know there's a lot of places, a lot of different churches you could be at, and we are so glad that you are right here at Crossroads worshiping with us this Easter. And so if you have not already, um, stop by our Welcome Center on your way out if it's your first time today. We have a gift bag there. It has some goodies in there. Just let them know it's your first time, and we would love just to be a blessing to you with that. I know we've had several guests already today, even in this service in church. Aren't you so excited to have our guests with us? So there's a lot of people here. I'm sure there's some people you don't know. So let's stand up, find someone you don't know, and introduce yourself. participate with me. I want you to do this. I would like for you to close your eyes. Everybody's eyes are closed. And I want you to visualize something. I want you to picture the most spectacular sunrise that you have ever seen. Get that picture in your head of the most beautiful sunrise that you've ever seen. And some of you right now are thinking, nothing is coming to me because I don't wake up early enough <laughs> to see the sunrise. That's okay. You can open your eyes and look this way. Hey, living, we are blessed to be living uh, in Daytona Beach. Amen? We are so close to the ocean, we can go anytime we want, pretty much, and get, er get there early enough to see the beautiful sunrise. And, and I've seen some beautiful sunrises, and I'm sure you have also. But the most special sunrise ever is not the one that you see rising from the ground, so to speak, above the water. But the most special sunrise is not the S-U-N, but it's the S-O-1. And as you see on the screen today, that's the title of my message, is the most special sunrise ever. And the message today is Jesus is alive. In just a minute, I'm going to get into the Word of God, but if you want to turn there, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the New Testament. 
Also, on the handout you received when you came in, we also have the verses on there as well if you want to follow along. But I do want to tell you a story about a man before we get into the Word. And this is a man that most of you probably are familiar with. How many of you have ever heard of a person by the name of Harry Houdini? Okay. If you've never heard of him, look him up. Now, Harry Houdini was famous, and his claim to fame was this, and that was that he could get out of anything. He specialized in spectacular escapes. He broke through locks. He would break through handcuffs. They would wrap chains around him, and he would escape. They would wrap him up in ropes, and he would figure a way to untie himself and get out. You know, those things were no problem for Harry Houdini to try to escape from. You name it, he got out of it. And some say Houdini was the most flexible person that they saw. Again, he could squirm his way out of anything, but he put his life in danger so many other times with these feats that he tried to accomplish by escaping certain things. You know, many people said he had more lives than a cat. And they say a cat has how many lives? Nine, nine lives. So he probably had like a thousand and nine, nine lives. I mean, this guy, like I said, was amazing as an escape artist. And again, they would do all kinds of things to try to confine him. One time, they placed him in a coffin, and they sealed that coffin shut, and he escaped. Another time, they placed him in a canvas bag, and they sewed that canvas bag closed, and he would escape. You know, they, would, they, they actually put him in a barrel, and they sealed that barrel closed, and he would escape. And then finally they said this, let's do this, let's put him in a maximum security prison. Let's put him someplace in which no one has ever escaped. So they put him behind bars in this cell, maximum security prison, and guess what happened? He escaped. He still escaped. Somehow he got out. He could break out of anything. But then the day came. The month was October, the year was 1926, and death laid its hands on Harry Houdini and put him in the grave. But Harry Houdini knew he was going to die, and right before he died, he said this to his wife. He said, one year from the date that I die, I'm going to come back and I'm going to visit you to show you that I have escaped from death. He figured he could escape from anything, even including death. So on the one-year anniversary, October 1927, came and gone. His wife was waiting for him, but no Harry Houdini. After two years, after three years, and then finally after ten years, the life of Harry Houdini gave up. And she realized that death had Harry Houdini. And he could not escape death. I share that story with you because I want to compare Harry Houdini to another person who I think you're very familiar with. Have you, have you ever heard of the person named Jesus Christ? Does that name sound familiar? When you compare Harry Houdini to Jesus Christ, again, Jesus also encountered death. Death laid his hand on Jesus Christ. And death put Jesus in a rock-solid tomb. There was a stone that was placed on top of that tomb. But the Bible says that stone could not keep him out. And by the way, we do know the story, and that is Jesus rose from the grave. Amen? Amen. And he left those grave clothes behind like a butterfly would forsake a cocoon. And that stone above the grave was rolled out of the way. And by the way, that stone was not rolled out of the way to let Jesus out. It was to let other people in. So that way they could see he is risen indeed. You see, something like this could not confine our all-powerful God. And on that very day, that stone was rolled away more than 2,000 years ago to let other people come in and see what happened. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, here in verse number 12, if you want to look at it with me, he starts off with a question. And he says, now if Christ is preached, 
that he rose from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? So Paul is saying this, he says, although I can preach to you this morning on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, thousands of preachers around this country are preaching this morning. He says, although all of us can preach the most awesome truth, and that is that Jesus is risen from the grave, Paul says there will be some people that will do the most unthinkable thing. They will doubt. But the truth is right before our eyes in God's word. The heart of the gospel is right here in chapter 15. The good news of what Jesus did for us. If you look with me in verse number 3, about halfway through, it says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and then he what? He rose again. See, Paul teaches this truth from God's word. And no preacher, whether it's me here this morning in Daytona Beach, whether it's preachers in Volusia County, in the state of Florida, in our country, in the entire world, there's no preacher that can preach the gospel, the good news of Christ, without the resurrection from the dead. That's the climax. That's the turning point. You see, the story doesn't end when Jesus died on the cross. You know, praise the Lord, he died on the cross for my sins. Amen? But that's not the end of the story. The resurrection is a continuation of the story. That's the climax. Again, that's the turning point. That is the future hope that we have and that we hold on to. You see, there's a difference. There's a difference between Jesus and Harry Houdini. There's a, Jesus, there's a difference between Jesus and anyone else, specifically founders of religions of the world. And the difference is this. Other people, they lived and they died. But without Christ, they're still dead. But the Bible says that Jesus lived. He died, but then he rose again and he's alive today. And the Bible says there's no need. There's no need for us to follow after someone else besides Jesus. There's no need to follow a dead-end dead -end religion when you've been offered the abundant life here on earth. Provided by our living Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one that lived, who died, but the Bible says in the book of Revelation that is alive forevermore. Harry Houdini, he was known for great things, like breaking out of chains. But Jesus is the real chain breaker. He can set you free from anything that you are in bondage to if you turn it over to him. Just turn it over to him, and he will help you today with anything. Why? Because he has the power to do that. He has the power to defeat death. So he can do anything for you. You see, people sometimes ask, okay, I understand that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose from the grave, but what about me? When I die, will I be able to defeat death? Will I be able to conquer death? And the answer to that question is yes. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, these words on the screen. It says, we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us. Just a few verses after that, Paul said these words. He said, I am persuaded that not even death will separate us from the love of God. From the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, in Romans chapter 1, verse number 4, speaking of Jesus Christ, it says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power. How? By the resurrection from the dead. That's how Jesus displayed his power, was by defeating death. You see, the power to defeat death, to rise from the dead, is beyond all human ability. I can't raise you from the dead. <laughs> no one else that's a human being that I know can raise people from the dead. That's beyond all human ability. Houdini couldn't do it. It takes supernatural ability. It takes supernatural power. It takes power that is possessed by the only begotten Son of God. And you might ask, well, how do I know that he can save me from eternal death? Well, there's a great verse in the Bible. It's not on your handout. It's not in the, on the screen. But if you want to jot it down, it's 2 Corinthians 4.14. And I love this verse. 
In that verse, it says that you don't have to try to guess. You don't have to try to hope. You don't even have to try to pray that you go to heaven one day if you're a believer in Jesus. That verse in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 4.14 says this. It says, knowing, I can know, knowing that the Lord God and the fact that he raised up Jesus shall raise us up also. So if you know that God raised Jesus from the grave, you can know that he can raise you up also. You see, one day the Bible says every single person will have to stand before God after we die. The Bible says in the last chapters of the book that as we stand before God, the book of life will be opened. And the Bible says that whosoever's name is not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. So you want to make sure your name is written in the book of life. Because when we stand before God, he is the righteous judge, which means God always does what's right. The Bible says he's righteous. The Bible says he's holy. He will not allow sin to enter into his holy heaven. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is for me to believe in the righteous one, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so that way, when I get to heaven, I'm not getting to heaven, getting to heaven on my own merit, but I'm going through Jesus. Amen? And the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. But the Bible says this also. It says that when we stand before God one day, the penalty of our sin is death, which is separation from God forever. God has imposed death, separation from him for all eternity, as the penalty for our sin. But think about this. The one that has imposed death as the penalty is also the one that has the power to defeat death. Does that make sense? God has imposed death as the penalty, but he's also the one that can defeat death since he's the one that imposed death. It's that simple. There was a time in which Jesus was talking to these two ladies. They were sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus had just done the impossible. Jesus just raised their brother Lazarus from the dead. But then Jesus said to these, these words to those two sisters that day that are recorded for us in John chapter 11. He said, I am the resurrection, resurrection and the life. life. Jesus said, he who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. What? If I believe in Jesus... Even though I'm going to die, I'm still going to live? And whoever lives and believes in me, Jesus said, shall never die. never die. Yeah, we might be absent from our body one day, but the Bible says at that point we don't die because we're going to be present with, uh, with the Lord. But then he posed this very important question to those two ladies that day, Mary and Martha. And the question that he asked them is the same question that should penetrate our hearts today. Jesus' words, do you believe this? Yes. Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Yes. And you believe that if you believe in me, you will never die. You see, back here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says... Although Paul wrote these words, Paul is not telling you to simply believe his words by faith. Although they were given by divine inspiration by God, and we should. But Paul says, hey, you don't have to just believe me and what I'm saying. But believe this. I saw it. I was an eyewitness to it. Paul says that there were witnesses to the truth of Christ's resurrection. He's saying, hey, there are people that saw Jesus after he rose from the grave. Look with me back at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 5. He says, Jesus was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the twelve. Then he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater remain to this present time, though some have passed away. Then he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. 
And in verse number 8, he concludes this section. He says, last of all, I just want you to know, he was seen by who? He says, he was seen by me. He says, he was seen by me. How impactful, how powerful that is. You see, I want you to understand what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that all the people that he just mentioned, including himself, could testify that Jesus was alive after he resurrected from the grave because they had seen him, because they had talked with him, because they ate with him some good broiled fish along the lakeside. The Bible says that's what they ate with Jesus. They fellowshiped with him. They touched him after his resurrection. You see, some people sometimes need to see in order to believe. One of Jesus' disciples, his name was Doubting Thomas. And all the other disciples were so excited, they said, We have seen Jesus. He's alive. He's not in the grave anymore. And he's physically alive. He's not a ghost. We've touched him. We've handled him. And Peter, or excuse me, Thomas said this, I will not believe until I see him. And Jesus was so gracious with Thomas, and he appeared in the Thomas, and he allowed Thomas to touch him in order for him to believe. You see, you might be, you might be saying this. You might say, Pastor Rich, how do I know that those disciples didn't just make this up? How do I know that this is not just a story, that this really isn't fact, but it's fiction? How do I know that? Well, I'll tell you how you can know for sure. Verse number 10. Paul writes, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul said after he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, he was no longer an enemy of Christ. You might remember before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul, and he was a persecutor of Christians. He would hunt them down. He would see that they were beaten. He would see that they were imprisoned. He was the enemy of Jesus. But after, on his way to the city of Damascus, he encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ. And when he saw Jesus with his own eyes that he was, in fact, alive— he was no longer an enemy of Jesus, but he became one of the greatest evangelists of Christianity. You see, he traveled all around three different missionary journeys, leading people to faith in Jesus Christ, establishing churches, training leaders, and so much more. And it wasn't a cakewalk either. Paul now was on the receiving end of the persecutions. He was on the receiving end of the beatings. He was on the receiving end of the imprisonments. Why would Paul endure all these things? Why would Paul labor more abundantly than them all? It was because Christ was alive. And he saw it. And he believed. And Paul gives us his testimony. As well as the testimony of others. The Bible, as well as history, tells us that most of the disciples, they pay for their lives. For their testimony, for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. History tells us that they suffered, they bled, they died because they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hey folks, today we have it much easier, don't we? <laughs> These guys were establishing the faith of Christianity and went through so much in order for it to continue on and on to us 2,000 years later. These disciples were faithful. They weren't hypocrites. Hypocrites aren't made of the same stuff. A man might live a lie, but few will die for a lie. And these disciples, they testified. They said, he is alive. We know he is alive. And they sealed their testimony, many of them, with their lives. The resurrection of Jesus Christ plays such a vital role in our salvation. Because when that day comes... When you and I stand before God, and the Bible says it will come, that righteous judge, we want to make sure that when we stand before him, we stand before him not guilty, but we stand before him to when he sees us. He doesn't see us in our sin, but he sees his son. Speaking of Jesus, because of our belief in him 
and what he has done for us. You see, until that day comes in which you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins. But thanks be to God that he gives you a chance to be saved, saved from eternal death. And the Bible says all we have to do is this. We have to tell God that we believe. Romans 10, 9 says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. Amen. And once you've accepted Christ as your risen Savior, your only hope of heaven, you're no longer dead in your sins because you have a risen Savior that has paid the price for your sins. Death no longer has dominion over you. I'm so glad that I have that kind of gospel to preach. I am so glad that life just doesn't end in a veil of tears, and we just say goodbye, and we don't ever have a chance to see each other ever again. I'm so glad that's not the way it is. Because verse number 20, if you look at it with me, says, But now is Christ risen from the dead. And because of that fact, we know death is defeated. We know the future is fabulous. We know that all fear is gone. And life is worth the living just because he lives. You know, praise the Lord for that. I love songs like that. Because he lives. We sang that last week. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And because he lives, we can sing those songs like we sang earlier today, that he is worthy. We can sing because of Christ. We can sing thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Jesus has taken the gloom out of the grave. Jesus has given us a future that is steadfast and sure. In verse number 22, it says, For all those that are in Adam, Adam was the first man, all those that are in Adam, he's the one that we inherited our sin nature from, all in Adam, they die. But then it says, All in Christ shall be made alive. Verse 57, it tells us who to give thanks for that. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory for, for, uh, from the, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Harry Houdini, he was a great escape artist, probably the greatest ever, but he's no comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can pull off the greatest escape ever. You can escape death. You can escape eternal separation from God if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ today. Believe that he died for your sins. He rose from the grave. Today is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It's the day that we celebrate Jesus and all that it means for those who believe. Jesus is alive today. But the question is this, does he live in you? Much of my life has been spent in an attempt to be significant somehow, to make a name for myself. Even if people were cursing it along the way, at least they were saved. Maybe it was the look in my eye, maybe it was the way I was dressed, I never knew for certain, but even as a child, people would whisper, some would even say out loud, here comes trouble. How could I argue with it? Every time I came to the fork in the road, I took the path of least resistance. I guess debauchery would be another word for it. it seemed harmless at first. At first only in my head. 
then in ways I thought no one would notice. But then it became my way of life. It became me. I was debauchery. I was indecent, immoral, impure. I was the one to blame. You know, condemnation never stirred me much. My ever-present companion always there to make sure that I knew that I was never enough. But shame, shame I hadn't known. I had always sufficiently hidden in the shadows, but now I was thrust into the light. But what hurt even worse than that was the sudden realization of who I truly was. The person no one knew, or I thought no one knew. When Jesus told the thief on the cross next to him that he would be with him in paradise, it penetrated my soul. What choice did I have but to let it? I could see him slipping away now. As Jesus died on the cross, paying for sins he didn't commit, asking his Father God to forgive me, me, who else had ever stood up for me like that? Who else had ever said, I am with you? He knew everything about me. And I barely knew him at all. But I believed in him. And that's all he needed. And he never let me go. team makes their way up for our final song. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me just for a couple of moments as we reflect on the message today on what Jesus did for us. Hey, one day just like Harry Houdini, death is going to come and knock on your door. And we never know when it's going to happen. It could happen very unexpectedly. And you want to make sure that you are ready you want to make sure that you're going to the right place <laughs> after you die. I want to tell you this. If you're here today, I want to tell you God loves you. And God's desire is for everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth of what we share today and be saved. That's God's desire for you. Will you make his desire your desire? Will you turn from your sins and receive Jesus as your Savior? Will you receive his free gift of salvation? Will you receive his free gift of eternal life? Would you allow him to come into your heart and life today and make a difference? I love that verse that Emily quoted earlier in the service from Acts 4.12, where it says, It's only by Jesus, the name of Jesus, that we must be saved. There's salvation in no other. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here this morning, within the sound of my voice, those that are in this building, those that are watching online, and you're not 100% sure that you would go to heaven when you die, don't delay don't let this time slip away. If your heart's desire today is to believe, here on Easter Sunday, your desire is to be saved, to receive God's gift of his son to you, to receive the abundant life that he wants you to live today, and that eternal life for all eternity in the future. Don't delay. Just pray. With your heads bowed and with your eyes closed, if that's you and you say, Pastor Rich, I am not 100% sure I would go to heaven when I die. You can know for sure. By the
giving your heart to Jesus. More important than the words that you say is the belief in your heart. Would you pray these words and say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe that you died for my sins on the cross. And now I accept your free gift of salvation and a home in heaven one day. Hey man, thank you, Pastor Rich, for the incredible message. You guys can stand up. It's still hard to believe that more than 2,000 years ago, the angel said, He is not here, He is risen. That we have a living Savior. This is our salvation, this is our hope. So we're going to respond with this last song.
Before we conclude, I just want to draw your attention to a few things on your handout. If you made the decision today to accept Jesus into your life, we have a card here on the front. It's perforated. You can tear it off. But if you would fill this out, bring it over to the welcome desk. We have a gift for you, some stuff to help you grow in your new, in your new relationship with Jesus. Um, and then on the other side, too, we have a baptism class coming up on April 14th. <clears throat> also today, if you uh, gave your life to Jesus, that would be a wonderful next step as well. To come attend our baptism class. We're going to have a baptism at the beach uh, near the end of April, and we would love to have you as a part of that. Uh, just a couple other things to draw your attention to before we uh, go on our way here. Um, Saturday, April 6th, we're going to be tearing down our R3 Bethlehem City out here. So if you're able to come out for that, we would love to have you. We're going to start at 9 in the morning. Come on out, and we're going to get that thing torn down and put away. Um, and then uh, one more Wednesday night, May 1st, we're going to be starting a Wednesday night service at 6 p.m. We would love to see you there. love to have you a part of that as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for everybody who's here. Thank you so much for the souls that turn to you today, Lord. I just um, pray for everyone. Bless us as we go, and thank you for your resurrection and the life you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.